So by the way, uh, I know that a lot of you have some more questions. I uh, hope these guys may be hanging out for a bit afterwards. So if you want to come by them, talk to a real life scientist and ask some serious questions. You can do that out there in the bar. Support the uh, the bar here. Buy them a drink. I'm doing it this way. They're running out of drink tickets. They didn't get that many, so they would very much appreciate that. Uh, okay, great. So we've got one final speaker. So uh, get fired up. This one's called IQ Points for Sale, Cheap. Uh, Dean Zachary Hambrick, PhD, a professor of psychology at Michigan State University, has argued in studies and the popular press that the promise of cognitive training has been overhyped. In the past year, he has co-authored two studies finding that working memory training does not increase intelligence, although his latest did find that it might still have benefits. In 2012, he published an opinion piece in the Times, urging people to regard the commercial brain training programs with caution. Dr. Hambrick will offer the Empiricist League a skeptic's view of cognitive training. Let's hear it for Dr. Zachary Hambrick. Okay, now, so this is a skeptic's view. Don't throw any beer bottles at me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the coolest venue I've ever talked at. It's uh, all the year. <laughs> Quite a contrast to uh, academic conference. <laughs> In a good way, in a good way. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, by the way, that title, you can thank the, thank the um, editors of the New York Times. They came up with that. So I wrote this op-ed, and um, one thing I discovered is that they, uh, they come up with a title, so I didn't see that until I got my paper in Lansing, Michigan. On Sunday morning, I was like, oh. So I added, um, actually added a, a question mark uh, to that because... Um, well, while I am skeptical um, of some of the claims that are being made, I'm certainly um, open uh, to this being, being real. So um, I thought I would, let's see, set the stage uh, for my comments here with this great quote from Carl Sagan. It seems appropriate for this gathering of the Empiricist League. So he said, uh, what counts um, is not what sounds plausible, not what we would like to believe, not what one or two witnesses claim, but only what is supported by hard evidence rigorously and skeptically examined. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and so that's really the theme uh, for this talk. So the extraordinary claim, of course, is that brain training works um, as advertised, and in particular that brain training improves fluid intelligence, um, and thus your life. So to get back to a comment that was made over here earlier, the, the promise of this is that you can do this training and it can make you more effective um, in the workplace, um, in the home, and making decisions, and in the real world. So that, that's what uh, the extraordinary claim is. So fluid intelligence is the ability to solve problems and adapt to uh, new situations, and it's typically measured with tests that require some sort of on-the-spot problem solving. So you're not simply retrieving the answer from memory. Uh, this is a, a, a type of problem that is on a, a very famous test of fluid intelligence called Raven's Progressive Matrices, named after uh, John Raven, who came up with it. And basically, you can see that there's a series of patterns that change across rows and uh, or across columns and down rows, and uh, your task would be to figure out the, the pattern that, that goes in the missing cell. So a little background on this, as, as you've already heard, there have been many attempts um, and many failures to increase intelligence through cognitive and educational interventions. In fact, psychologists have been interested in increasing intelligence for as long as they study um, intelligence. And the classic pattern of empirical results in this literature is near transfer but no but no far transfer. And Jason already described this. Um, I'll illustrate it with um, some old school uh, video games. So near transfer um, would be uh, playing uh, Miss Pac-Man um, and then improving on Mr. Pac-Man. <laughs> Right, um, or on a very a very similar video game. 
Um, maybe another video game that involves moving some figure through uh, a maze. And there is this video game, I'm not making this up, that I found called Tinkle Pit. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually the name of it. Um, so, near transfer, you train on um, a task and you get better at similar tasks, okay? So, far transfer would be practicing this Pac-Man and then getting better at Galaga, let's say, um, or at studying in a classroom, or driving a car, or even a work-related task like flying an airplane, okay? So, uh, this is the pattern that's been elusive in uh, research on training and intelligence. All right, so um, in this um, really excellent book, I highly recommend it, Dan's book, um, he talks about, in the first, uh, first chapter, I think, um, a study that was published uh, six years ago um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, purporting to show far transfer. So here, here was the extraordinary claim that was made in this paper. Here we present evidence for far transfer from training on a demanding working memory task to measures of fluid intelligence. GF is the abbreviation for fluid intelligence. This transfer result, even though the trained task is entirely different from the intelligence test itself. Furthermore, we demonstrate that the extent of gain intelligence critically depends on the amount of training. The more training, the more improvement in fluid intelligence. Thus, in contrast to many previous studies, we conclude that it's possible to improve fluid intelligence without practicing the testing tasks themselves over a wide range of applications. Okay, so let me tell you um, in some more detail about what they found. So this is this fiendishly difficult dual in-back task. So you're monitoring an auditory stream and a visual stream for targets. It's very difficult. And um, in the study, the subjects received 8, 12, 17, or 19 sessions of this task. Um, there's also a control group. Now, this was a pre-test, post-test design. So before the training, um, the subjects completed a test of matrix reasoning, the one I showed you a few minutes ago, um, as a measure of fluid intelligence before or in after training, or a comparable time for the subjects who were in the control group. Okay, is that, is that all clear? Okay. Okay, so, so here's what they found. Um, on the left, you can see pretest to post test for the training group, solid circles, pretest to post test for the control group, open circles. And the key finding to note here is that that line is steeper for the training group than for the control group. They also reported a dosage-dependent relationship. So the training gain and in intelligence increased as a function of the amount of training. So the least gain for the eight session group, the most gain for the 19 session group. More training, more improvement. So here's what they concluded. The finding that cognitive training can improve fluid intelligence is a landmark result because this form of intelligence has been claimed to be largely immutable. Instead of regarding fluid intelligence as an immutable trait, our data provide evidence that with appropriate training, there's potential to improve it. Okay, uh, the senior scientist um, who was on the paper kind of summed that up. He said, our discovery is that four weeks or so of training will produce a noticeable difference in fluid intelligence. We've also shown that the longer you train short-term or working memory, the more improvement you get in IQ. So this was a real, this was big news um, in the literature. It created quite a splash. Uh, Robert Sternberg, a very famous intelligence researcher, said that their findings seems in some measure to resolve the debate over whether fluid intelligence is trainable. Discover Magazine called this one of the top 100 stories uh, of 2008. Okay, so 
Why the fuss? Why is this an extraordinary claim? Well, to us, to me, the magnitude of the gain was larger than seemed possible. Okay, so this is a normal curve for IQ. The average for the population is 100. Um, standard deviation of 15. Okay, so um, on up to 130, which is sometimes sort of a conventional cutoff for what people call uh, genius. Although that's a big debate. All right. So, so here was the magnitude uh, of the gain that was being reported in this study. Okay, so on the left, you see the graph again from their paper. Now, that number in green is an effect size, which Jason told you about. And to make a long story short, we can take their effect size, and given a standard deviation of 15 for IQ, we can do a little arithmetic, and we're talking about a six-point IQ gain. Six-point IQ gain. The average amount of training across those four groups in that study was six hours. So what we're talking about is a one IQ point increase per hour. Okay, average IQ, 150th percentile, to genius in 30 hours of training. So that was larger than seemed possible. This struck, struck us as uh, implausible. Okay, so we need some guidance, Carl Sagan. So to return to his co uh, quote, what counts is not what sounds plausible, not what we would like to believe, but only what is supported by hard evidence rigorously and skeptically um, examined. So here was our skeptical examination of this, of this study. So one problem um, was that they only used, at pre-test and post-test, they only reported a single test of matrix reasoning as the basis for the claim that training increases fluid intelligence. Okay, the problem with this in somewhat technical terms is that a test, let's say a matrix reasoning, it will capture to some degree what you want it to capture, like fluid intelligence, but it also captures other factors. Okay, so it's possible that that training-related increase reflected these other irrelevant factors that we weren't interested in. Um, another problem um, is that in that study there was only a no-contact control group, and thus alternative explanations for training effect were possible, in particular motivation. Okay, imagine that you're in the group that receives 19 sessions of training. You get to know the experimenters. You come in frequently, okay? They're nice to you. They want you to come back. Okay? They're not consciously trying to influence how you perform, but there's a rapport that's, uh, that's formed. Okay, if you're in the control group, you know, you come in twice, separated by, you know, four weeks, and so maybe you care less. Okay. Uh, there were also differences in uh, the procedures across these training groups. Remember, again, that there were um, 8, 12, 17, and 19 sessions of training. Well, uh, there were some differences in the procedures across those groups that complicated the interpretation of the results. So the group that received eight sessions, they got a test called Ravens, the one I told you about. They had a 20-minute time limit with 18 items. Um, in the 12, 17, and 19 groups, they had a test called the BOMAT. Um, for the 12 and 17 session groups, they had 10-minute time limits. For the 19 session group, they had a 20-minute time limit. Okay, so we have a, we really can't even, it's arguable whether you can even compare uh, the eight session group to the other, so I dropped that out. And, you know, if we did an adjustment for time limit for the fact that they had twice the amount, the amount of time, then that dosage-dependent relationship goes away. All right. Another problem is that there were many other transfer tests that were administered in this study, um, but it was only 
uh, only one result, uh, one test that was reported. So this raised the possibility that, well, maybe they're capitalizing on chance here. Okay, so we felt like, given these issues, that there was a need to replicate this um, important study. So we had three groups of subjects. We had a dual impact training group, just like in the original study. We had a no contact control group, just like in the other study. So they were there for at the beginning and the, um, in the end, um, but had no further contact with experimenters. And then we had a, a third group, which is sort of the uh, the placebo group. This is the dual impact group. This group had a demanding cognitive task called visual search. Okay, so you're looking at these displays and deciding whether you see a target letter, uh, the, the letter F is facing left or right amid distractors. You're really sort of mind-numbingly boring task. Um, and this was a placebo task because we knew based on previous research that this doesn't correlate with working memory. Okay, of course subjects don't know this, right? So it's a placebo. Okay, so we had 20 sessions of training in our study. We had three points at which the subjects took multiple tests of fluid intelligence. Eight different tests instead of just one. All right, so here were the possible patterns of results. One possibility is that dual impact training increases fluid intelligence just like this earlier study had claimed. In that case, you would see the dual impact group getting better in fluid intelligence from the beginning of the study to the end. One possibility is it doesn't work, or another possibility, in which case you would see a pattern like this. And then a third possibility is that both the dual impact group and the placebo group both showed an increase. And what this would suggest is that dual impact training may increase fluid intelligence, but really not for the reason that we thought, not through an increase in working memory. Maybe it's more of a motivational phenomenon. Okay, so that's 15 minutes, right? All right, so keep in mind this pattern right here. This is what we want to see. All right, so here are our results for the test of fluid intelligence. Okay, that's the first one, that's the second one, third one fourth one, fifth one. This was essentially the, the same type of matrix reasoning test that the Yaki et al. study used. Here's another version of that. And then um, this is a composite score reflecting performance across all of those tests of fluid intelligence. And you can see uh, that there was certainly no evidence for the pattern that would suggest that dual impact training works. So our attempted replication, we found zero improvement in fluid intelligence. Um, subsequently, we published this study, um, and there have been other published failures uh, to replicate, um, a number of other pu published failures uh, to replicate. Um, there was a meta-analysis. Um, these studies had to have uh, randomized control trials. Treatment group had to receive an intervention for at least two weeks. Um, and the studies had to provide data so that an effect size could be calculated. Um, look at this triangle on the bottom, okay? So there was a little bit of an effect of, of training. This is a graph representing the extent of FAR transfer, okay? So Pac-Man to Galaga. Um, that estimate was near zero when you only considered studies that had the active control group. Now, I'll say just briefly that we recently published another study that is a little bit better news. Um, we gave people training in the sort of complex span test that Jason uh, described. Um, we had tests of fluid intelligence and we replicated our earlier finding, I mean, nothing from pre-test to post-test. We have three uh, different training groups, and there was no training-related improvement on any test of fluid intelligence from pre-test to post-test. What we did find is this sort of Miss Pac-Man to Pac-Man type uh, transfer. 
So after training in these complex span tasks, people got better at other complex span tasks. We also found Ms. Pac-Man to tinkle pit type transfer. So people, after receiving training in working memory tasks, got better at other tests of, of working memory that were not of the same type, but were still tests of working memory. All right. So my argument is that the extraordinary claims about increasing fluid intelligence through a short amount of cognitive training, the evidence is simply not there. I will end on a positive note. It absolutely is possible to improve intelligence. We've been talking about fluid intelligence. We haven't talked about crystallized intelligence. Crystallized intelligence is knowledge acquired through experience. And we've had a technology around for, oh, a pretty long time that we know improves crystallized intelligence. Anybody know what it is? The book. Thanks. Yes. Um, you talk about control and placebos being different. So that's, I mean, in your control right. test, do people just come in and just like literally do the same thing? Okay, good question. Then we actually had what you might think of as two control groups. One control group was a no contact control group. That's not hard. Right, so they came in and did, you know, the, at pre test, mid test, and post test, but they had no contact with us in the intervening times. We had the, also an active control group. So they did the pre-test, mid-test, and post-test, and they did the placebo task, right? So does that answer the question? Right, well, what I'm wondering is the control group that's like doing nothing, not the placebo, right. but the other control group. Is there like a level of a group segment? Not like the emotions are like altering this, but do you think that that has anything to do with like, do you know what I mean? Like people maybe pursuing the death ball like actively Hmm. Because they kind of know that they're not even, they don't even get to be the people. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, they, you know, we don't tell them. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, we, I mean, we don't, I um, actually don't remember offhand what we told subjects about the purpose of the experiment. I don't know whether they knew in this study whether, whether the other subjects were doing something. Yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. How do you kind of measure someone's you know, yes or working memory? Not on a not on a computer right. thing, but in the real world, your time management skills. Your, yeah. You know whether you can make lists and follow them, and, and in, in that sense, like if you're doing, if you're attempting to kind of like activate these mm -hmm. tasks out in the real world, if there's been any studies yeah. that have you know made people try to do this and come. Yeah. Out and that that's a great question, and that's exactly the sort of study that must be done. Now, I mean, there have been plenty of studies where people give self-ratings of their effectiveness in daily tasks, right? Uh, but that's really not the same as giving people a task to objectively measure their performance in like the workplace. Well, I don't know. Right. Nobody's really done this, right? Right, I mean, right. Not, not the way you guys would be satisfied by it. People have done things like get teacher ratings of students' performance. Right, you can look at academic yeah. performance over yeah, math that's, skills, that's true, math yeah. skills like standardized tests. They still feel like they're a little bit like the lab tests, right? What you guys are after is like, is it make me better at my job? Driving the car or driving a car, for example. I believe, right. I believe yeah. uh, some of the driving because there's the yeah. useful, useful field view, right? right? Right. And that seems useful for driving. And yep. we know that uh, pilots in the U.S. Air Force yep. train on computerized programs. And it makes them better pilots. So right. uh, it's definitely possible to apply things to the real world. The question becomes how widely applicable are they? Right. How like are are you better at everything imaginable? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Of. Yeah. And and well, how the hell do you measure that? Yeah. So that becomes a real problem. 
So one other thing I wanted to mention, um, I focused on the idea that we can increase intelligence through a very short, and to a significant degree, through a short amount of training, like six hours of training. I don't think the evidence is there for that. There is one excellent study um, where people got cognitive training for 100 days, um, and they, they did have some, some pretty compelling evidence for a modest but still significant increase in fluid intelligence through 100 days of training on many different cognitive tasks. Now, geez, I mean, who wants to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So, I mean, the, the, the model that keeps on occurring to me in all of these talks is something of a triage model, which is, you know, pretty, pretty of course, stiff. But in our list, there might be some people who, you know, you, you would train and they would really benefit from. And then there would be some people who you would train and they wouldn't benefit at all. And, uh, you know, yeah. they, I mean, some people might be naturally, you know, they're going to be intelligent, but, you know, training isn't going to help them. Some people right. might have latent intelligence. Yeah. They would train and they would train. Some people, you know, might be, you know, with nothing. You can yeah. Do, uh, do you want to say anything more about that? Have you looked at this? Yeah. I mean, Brett, he alluded to one thing, which is that a number of us anecdotally have found that it's sort of like the rich get richer. You have to come in with a kind of starting point that's pretty good to begin with to actually show these kinds of improvements. Mm -hmm. But um, to address the question the way you asked it anyway, if we tried that triage model, we would never convince anybody that it works. Because what we'd be doing is we take, we take everybody and we go, oh, well, you know, only the people who it works for, it works for. Yeah, right. <laughs> and we try to convince you that it really works for them, and everybody who else fell, up, you know, fell up behind because it wasn't working, we'd say, well, you know, they were just the wrong type of person to get this kind of training. So what we try to do is include everybody and understand what it is about the individual that might predict whether they... So you're searching for the things that work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, many, many, many of us who are engaged in this effort are looking at... Uh, we're trying to figure out both what is the difference in the training paradigm itself, that, if, if any, that predicts whether you'll get these kinds of gains. But then also, what is it about the individual that makes them more or less receptive to it? And it could turn out to be something actually pretty uninteresting, like whether they believe they can get better or not. That's actually a claim that's been included. Yeah. You know, or the degree to which they're motivated to make themselves better rather than getting paid for the study. Those are other ideas. Yes? I'm, I'm actually curious about, there's, a, there's another side of the literature, the complement to this, which is, you know, uh, various experiences, uh, purely psychological or the environment, can undermine the performance. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, what you think the implications of that research might be improvements as well, right? Because you, I mean, I, what got me thinking about it is your muscle metaphor, right? Which is Baumeister's work, mm -hmm. which you're familiar with, which is this idea that it is a muscle that you can wear out and show depletion, or, you know, the other side is you can build it up and strengthen it, so. Yeah, you want to? Yeah. I, I got one quick one, which is a weird paradox there, which is this really interesting work. It's actually done in the fly, in the Australia, and um, the finding is that if you deplete the muscle, it's actually more prone to being increased. Kind of like you know, it's like when you work out as hard as you can, and then finally the muscle is totally broken down. And it turns out that the same chemical that's in muscle that makes that happen, called mTOR, is in the brain. Hmm. And so there are some researchers out there who believe that the way to make this work is to get it to be entirely depleted, and then train it. Hmm. And that's what's going to make it boost that work, just like a muscle would work. And I, you know, but, that but um, to, to address exactly what you were saying, I mean, we know that, for instance, kids living in bad yeah. neighborhoods, so those studies have shown that those in the exact same neighborhood who witnessed a violent act in their neighborhood, someone getting mugged, their IQ is slightly but significantly lower mm -hmm. afterward than those who did not witness those kinds of things. And we know that, you know, growing up amid, you know, in a chaotic home and where you're not reading and you're not getting all the things, you know, if you're just sitting around watching television, that this is really absolutely not good for you. And even uh, there's something called Dumber Over the Summer, that <laughs> children mm -hmm. will perform a little less well <laughs> in the fall than they seem to have done in the spring. So, um, you know, definitely there's ways to decrease intelligence, and the best way would be to lock someone in, a, in solitary confinement or a closet for a month 
and see how they're doing when they come out. Uh, you would definitely see dramatic differences. So this, all of this literature is really to the opposite of what stimulate you with this very particular kinds of uh, working memory training that is very difficult. Another way to uh, decrease intelligence, at least temporarily, is to uh, drink alcohol. Maybe we should all drink <laughs> <get> a <to> bar now. <laughs> so thanks to everybody. Thanks to um, Zach and to Jason and to Dan for speaking tonight. And thank you all for you guys for coming. Um, if you want to know about more events, please sign up for our Facebook page. And we have an a, a, a email list and also Twitter. So um, please stick around and talk to our speakers. And if you want to like, speak at some point at one of these events or if you want to come up and talk to us, please do so. Thank you. Thank you.